Today we're going to get a handle on things, so welcome back to Black Bear Forge. Last week we took a look at forging the blacksmith's weed whacker, and lots of people asked what I was going to do about a handle, or if it was even going to get a handle, or made suggestions of what I should do about a handle. And my first thought to those questions was, didn't you listen to the end of the video when I told you I was going to buy a shovel handle for it? So I've got a shovel handle. It's four feet long, which is probably a little bit longer than I need, but it gives me the option of cutting it shorter if it is too long, as opposed to starting with a short handle and wishing I had put a long one on it. So this is just a straight shovel handle. It's got a tapered end with a kerf in it, and this just almost fits perfectly in there. I think I'm going to try and enlarge the kerf a little bit so I don't split the handle as I put this in. And it's also a little bit longer than I, I want as far as the, the kerf goes. So I'm going to cut the last inch of this off and then work with it from there. But I think just putting this on and pinning it might be a little weak. I'm tempted to try that because this is not a heavy use tool. This is meant for chopping small weeds, not for clearing big brush. That's not what it's meant for. And I think it would hold up with just a couple of pins. And certainly if it were epoxied in at that point, it would probably hold up even better. But I think just to be absolutely sure, I'm going to make a pipe collar that will go on here. And this piece of pipe is plenty big enough to slide all the way up on. But I think I'll need to taper it so that it fits tight and doesn't wobble. Because right now it's just a little bit wobbly on there because it's not tapered. So that's the first thing to do is to taper the pipe. I'll probably have to grind the tang or the shank on this down a little bit to fit the taper. Right now it fits in there just fine, but once it's tapered, it may not fit. So we'll make sure that all goes together. Then we'll put the tool on the handle and it should be a relatively simple process. But if you stick around to the end of the video, then I've got a little bit of mail to open. Ed sent us a package of some stuff to go with the Chili Forge that might make using the Chili Forge just slightly more convenient, so we'll take a look at what Ed sent. Then I want to ask your opinion about some forge setup here in the shop and see what you would rather see on the video, but I'm going to save that. So if you want to offer your opinion about forges, that'll be the time to do it. So first things first, let's heat this up and let's forge a taper in this piece of pipe. So I've set my double calipers, one for the small diameter that I want here in the end and one for the length that I want. That way, as I work the pipe down, I can make sure that my taper is the right length and work it down so that it's the right diameter on the inside. Pipe will transfer heat more than solid bar will, so plug the end. Just stuffing a rag in it works. If the rag catches fire, just put it out. I'm going to work here in the step of the anvil so it's supported on two sides and hammering on one. I'm going to go very slowly real easy to crush tubing or pipe and then it's hard to get it back to what you want you're actually upsetting the tubing at this point so as it gets thicker this gets a little bit less finicky and it's easier to not crush it but that takes a little while. You probably need some grinding at the end to clean it up because it'll be uneven after doing all this. to try and get this in down to where I want it before I worry too much about the entire taper. And then I'll just work from there back. It's still considerably larger than I want. Now if you don't have a step on your anvil, you can use a V-block.
Even if you do have a step on your anvil, this might be a little bit simpler. Working straight down is often easier than coming in at an angle like the step forces you to do. Keep looking at it to see where it's round and where it's oval and deal with any kinks before they get bad. Getting a lot closer. Now this is going to look exactly the same at the anvil for about the next half hour as I slowly sneak up on the size I want. And I don't see any reason for you to sit there and watch me tap, 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 tap over and over again. So I'm going to go ahead and get this done and we'll pick it up with actually fitting the handle to the tool and fitting the socket to the handle and doing all that kind of stuff. Now you can also work this down in a simple swedge if you've got a swedge that's the right size. And if you've got a top swedge that's the right size, that might make your life easier. But you might want a striker at that point. I also have a drift that is pretty darn close. I didn't make this for this, it just happens to be pretty darn accurate for this. So I'm going to put the drift in there. And do just a little bit of swedging to clean up the lumps and the bumps. Biggest problem with this is that's now stuck in there pretty darn tight. But Sometimes you can get it out just like that. I figured I was going to have to put something down in here and drive it out, but that worked really well. So I'm going to let this cool off, and then we are going to see if it fits on the shovel handle, and then we're going to make the tool fit in this and do whatever we got to do. And we should have a handle on this thing in pretty short order. That's really about all the forge work in today's project, so it's mostly now fitting and making sure that everything goes together the way you want it to. I've taken the time to clean up the ends of this so it's got nice clean edges, and hopefully it fits. Almost. A little bit of a tap goes right on there, and it looks good and tight and solid. So I think that is good. Now the problem we have next is this part doesn't fit anymore. It fits in the big end, but it doesn't fit in the small end. So I have two options for this, and it just almost fits. I can make this a lot thinner, and I may have to do that, especially up here at the top where it looks like it's just a little bit wider anyways. But I don't want to make it too thin, especially down here, because the handle is thicker and I want it to fill up this handle as much as I possibly can. So I think the other thing I'm going to do is just cut a little slot here to relieve this some and that'll also then allow it to slide up into here a little bit because in the long run I think that's where it's going to have to go. So if I cut about a half inch deep slot on either side of this, I think I'm going to be a lot happier with it. And this is a little bit on the oval side. It is not perfectly round so I'm going to do that on the long axis so that this fits a little bit better and that will be a little easier to get started and I think that'll make my life easier. up there at the fat end.
Okay, that should work. And I'll just clean this up a little bit with a file, make sure it's smooth. If this doesn't do the trick, we're still going to have to do some grinding. And we are still going to have to do some grinding. So I'm going to go to the grinder and I'm just going to grind this, hopefully just parallel because this does start. So if this is just, if I just clean this edge up, I should be able to get it all the way up into there. So a little bit of time on the belt grinder, just two or three minutes is all it took. And that goes down in there now. It's not quite as far in as I want and I'm going to be brave and hope that that is a drive-in fit in the end and that I can just drive that last little bit in and get it really good and tight in there. And if not, we may have to take it back apart. The next issue is it doesn't really fit all the way down inside this kerf, which means it's going to spread that a lot wider and it may not fit, although the tighter it fits and the more wedged it is, the better it'll be. But I would hate to crack this trying to drive it in there. So I'm gonna enlarge the kerf in kind of wedge shape a little bit. And I think I'll just do that on the porta band. I'll just run it real gently, cut a little tiny slice and a wedge off and leave it the original thickness down here at the bottom. I think that's going to be a lot better. It's still going to be a bit of a drive-in fit and that's kind of what I want but I want it to just barely be a drive-in fit because like I say I don't want to split anything nor do I want it to not go together properly. Now to know how far it should drive in I'm going to mark the top of the head the silver pencil and put just a little mark so that if it seats all the way to the bottom of the kerf I know that's all the further it should go. So now we're ready to actually assemble this. So I'm going to put the, the pipe socket on there. Boy, that goes on a little further than I would like now that I've done that. We'll see, see where that ends up in the long run. Then we're going to put this in there. I don't think it matters which way it goes. There's pretty much the same either way, I think. But as we drive this, I don't think that pipe socket's going to be able to go down any further. I think it's going to bottom out here. If it'll even drive in that far. I am using a rawhide mallet so I don't stress it any. It's about as tight a fit as I could hope for other than I wish it would go in just another half an inch. But I don't think it's going to. The last few blows have not moved, and I've actually cracked some of the bricks on my floor doing this. So I think I'm going to quit, because now I've got two bricks i got to replace down there. But that is now in there, and fits about as well as you could hope for, other than not being quite as far in as I might have hoped for. But, the, but it's good and snug. Next thing to do, I'm going to drill two holes, and we're going to put the pins in to retain it. This is where we find out if my hardening and tempering left that soft enough to drill. It feels like it did. Well, since those other rivets are a little bit too long, and I think they're too shiny for my taste for the project, I've got some 3 16 rivets, also too long, but I'll go trim those off. And then we'll set these, and this project 
should be ready to go give a serious trial to. Three sixteenths rivets set pretty well cold. I'm not going to use a rivet header. These are a domed head rivet instead of a round head rivet. So they're fairly flat to start with. I'll just try to replicate that freehand. I think that'll do the trick. Now I probably should have put my paste wax finish on this while it was still hot, but I think it'll be okay. We're just, I'll just go ahead and do that cold and that'll still give it pretty good protection. So is that four foot handle gonna be too long, too short, too fat, too skinny? Only time will tell. But there's the finished head end there. And I think this is going to be a good useful tool. The weight is just right, the size is just right. If anything, I think the handle might be about six inches too long. But I'm going to try it out for a week or two and see what I need before I bother to trim it. And I might sand it and trim it down so it's an oval handle instead of a round handle. And that helps you steer it a little bit better. In a round handle, it's easy to slip. But we do have some other things to talk about today. Like I say, Ed sent us a package. Got some files in it. Not this kind of file, this kind of file. And a McMaster car bag. Gotta love everything from McMaster car. What I'm sending you are two lock collars and he has a McMaster car part number. I'll put that down here. Although I think this is specific to the Chili Forge. So this may or may not work in this size for other forges. And he says you can install these on the burner tube under the choke at the sweet spot for the maximum choke opening. And I think we'll go look at what that means. That means I'll have to take the burner, the top part and the jets off the burner, but that shouldn't be a big deal. And then that, oh no, these are two piece collars. I don't have to take it apart. Two piece collars are way better for this than single piece would be. So these will come apart. Let's go, well, let's just go take a look over at the, the forge. Now this forge is still a little bit warm, so I'm not gonna mess with this too much. I'll put them on here so you can see what I think he's talking about on these. But the choke tubes are these tubes that let air in and they are adjustable, so you get just the right amount of air in depending on what you're doing. And these then are something you kind of have to mess with every time you, you light the forge. You have to readjust them and get them in the right place because it's better to close them when you turn it off, which I haven't actually done here because when we're doing the videos, I just turn the valves off and don't worry about messing with the chokes every single time. However, it looks like Ed has thought of that as well. So if I put this in there like that, That gives a stopping point for the choke collar and I no longer have to mess with the thumb screw to hold it in place. I can just loosen the thumb screw and let it slide down and the choke is preset. That's a pretty ingenious idea, Ed, and really simple. All you gotta do is buy the collars in the size appropriate for your forge if it has this style of chokes. But the other thing Ed has sent is a little bracket with a hook that'll go in here and this goes up here around the jet tube and hangs down so that you can then hook that 
thumb screw or you include a little piece of threaded rod to replace the thumb screw with and that way you don't have to mess with any of this you can just grab that pull it up and hook it on the hook and you never have to loosen or tighten the thumb screw it's always real quick and easy and that way I could close the chokes while we're doing videos a little bit more efficiently and that would probably be better for the forge because you really should close the chokes when you turn it off but I'll mess around with that a little bit and get this set up and make sure I've got things adjusted right and see how it works. But thank you, Ed, for thinking of me and thanks for sending the parts. I really appreciate it. But while we're here talking about the gas forge, I wanted to ask you guys a question and get your opinion. And what I'm looking at is the possibility of simply using the coal forge way more for the videos than I use the gas forge. The other day I took the gas forge off the coal forge. I really prefer to leave the gas forge sitting over here. This is the most convenient place to work. It's the best workflow. But to use the coal forge, you have to move it, and that gets kind of old. And as I look into building the ribbon burner forge, it's just simply not going to work there because the ribbon burner's got so much more going on. It's got a blower, it's got wiring, it's got gas valves, it's got other electrical components to control everything, and it's going to be a lot heavier and it is not going to be at all portable. It's going to have to go on a stand, it's going to live on the stand. Anywhere it goes, it's going to be on the stand and the stand will have wheels. For that matter, it's going to be the same stand that I'm using right now for the Chili Forge. So this is kind of an experiment to see what my options are. There's no doubt that I still prefer it over here, but if I go to a ribbon burner, that's just not going to work unless I get rid of the coal forge. And believe me, I've thought about that. For the last 30 years, I have worked 90% of the time in a gas forge. There are times I really like a coal forge. It's a lot of fun to work in a coal forge. But for my kind of work, the gas forge is way more efficient and everything I do I can find a way to do with the gas forge. Sometimes that means I resort to a torch more often. When I need those little precise heats that you can get in a coal forge, sometimes that's just a torch option, or sometimes I just find another way to do things that still gets the job done, but isn't necessarily the way I would do it in a coal forge. And of course the reverse is true. If you only have a coal forge, sometimes you gotta make concessions that you wouldn't have to make if you had a gas forge and can get bigger and longer heats and more even heats throughout a project. But anyways, I can certainly do what I did today and leave the gas forge right there, but that limits me a little bit as far as camera placements go. Now when the gas forge is sitting on the coal forge, or if I'm only using the coal forge, I have better than 180 degrees of possible camera placements. I can put a camera right here and get that nice close-up shot of the anvil. I can put a camera here and I can move cameras over here and straddle the swedge block, or I can move the swedge block. It doesn't always live here. But with the gas forge here, suddenly I've lost all of this space for cameras. But if I move it out of the way, if we weren't using it for the videos, then that allows me to bring cameras over into here and over here and I can bring this one over and I just get lots more in the way of options for getting good video at the anvil and if I use the coal forge that works and if I use the gas forge that pretty well works although where I've got this camera right now wouldn't be good for the gas forge because the gas forge puts out so much heat that that would really be damaging to the camera and I won't subject the cameras to that so there are some real advantages to having the coal forge as the primary forge for doing videos. But I know not everybody has a coal forge. And if I'm working in a coal forge, then you get subjected to a little bit more other stuff that just goes along with running a coal forge, like maintaining the fire, cleaning out the fire, things like that that don't apply for those of you who are working in gas forges. I think I'm also more inclined to use the overhead camera shot when I'm working in the coal forge than the gas forge because there is not as much heat going straight up to the ceiling of the shop. That's really a hot location if I'm running the gas forge. So that's a question I have for you and I think I can create a little survey where you can just click on an opinion that I can link to right up here and if that works, great. Go to that survey, answer the question and we'll see what people think and I'll try to go along with that as much as I can. No guarantees of course. But if that link doesn't work, and if I can't really do a survey the way I think I can, just 
leave a comment in the comment section. Do both. Doesn't really matter. I'm making videos to help you guys out as much as anything. And if you think you get more value out of watching me work in a coal forge, I'll work in the coal forge more. And I should quit saying coal forge. I should call it a solid fuel forge. Because when I run out of coal, I probably will not buy any more coal. Coal is really expensive around here, and the coal I get is really pretty lousy. So I'm probably done burning coal when I run out of what I got. Now, that's probably a year from now at the rate we do videos. But just so you know, that means that I'll either buy Coke, because I can have co Coke delivered by the truck full or a pallet of bags or something like that, just like I could coal. But it's a little bit cleaner to mess around with and might be a, a good option and something I'd like to try out if I'm going to use a solid fuel forge. But then there's also charcoal. And right now I can't make charcoal because we're still under a complete fire ban and probably will be all summer. So making my own charcoal is not going to be as practical as I would like it to be. But I can buy bag charcoal and I can have it delivered just like I can coal or coke. So if that's the way you guys want to see me work, that's probably what I'll do. And for the most part during the fire ban, I can still burn the forge in the shop because I have a chimney and a spark arrestor cap on the chimney. I just can't burn outside fires where I would be making the charcoal. No guarantees it'll stay that way. In a more severe fire ban, they might shut that down too. And if it stays as dry as it has been, that could be where we go. And in that case, it's going to be the gas forge one way or the other. But in any case, let me know what you think. What, what is your preference? How would you rather see it? The work at the anvil is essentially the same regardless of which forge I'm using. Although working in the coal forge, we probably will see more small forge welding projects because it's really very simple to just go ahead and forge weld something in the coal forge instead of waiting for the gas forge to come up to heat. So thank you to those who stuck around to the end of the video so that you can help me answer that question. I really appreciate that you take the time to do that. And I do hope you found the video interesting. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. Those are merely donations. The content remains free. In any case, I hope you can get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.